I'll get going. Uh, briefly about me, if anyone's interested. Uh, I've been doing IT for an awfully long time, worked in an awful lot of... It keeps doing that. Um, there we go. Uh, I've been working in IT an awfully long time, worked in an awful lot of different um, sectors. These days I work for uh, Muller, as in Corner. And uh, I'm told at some point I can expect delivery of free yoghurt, but I haven't yet. And I will carry on saying that at these talks until Liam works it out how to do that. So, uh, um, but that's me. So before I start talking about Jane Austen, because I will, because there's two kinds of people in the world. There are people who think Jane Austen is cool and people who are wrong. Uh, but first, um, I want to talk about breakfast cereal. I have two children. They, they, they appear to require regular feeding up to three times a day when they can get it. And um, each morning, they, uh, they, um, they generally have a breakfast cereal. And uh, my kids tend to be quite faddy. They, they like to have a favourite cereal, and then it gets boring, and it will shift to something else. These, these are three of their favourite cereals. Uh, I'm not including um, some of the ones that they get in from America that are full of sugar, because they're not having those. But uh, th these are pretty good. Um, and I wanted to create a statistical model of the sort of behaviour that my kids exhibit when they're choosing their breakfast cereal, which would require me to meticulously record what they eat every day for a month, and what sort of a monster would do that? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so as you can see, they are indeed quite faddy. They certainly have a bit of a preference for Cocoa Pops, and I don't blame them. They are very nice and chocolatey and yummy. Uh, we've also got a bit of a preference for Cheerios. Weetabix, we have little bursts of. Fine. Is this significant? Who knows, frankly. Uh, I only captured a month's worth of data, and uh, th this is good enough for my purposes. So the, they, they chose Weetabix nine times. That is nine in 30 or 30% of the time. They chose uh, Cocoa Pops 11 times, being 36% of the time. And, and 10 times they had Cheerios, which is, again, about a third. So we could, yeah, I'm not very good at drawing, am I? Um, we could choose a very simple model, which is simply for each day, if we wanted to replicate the behavior, make a choice and weight it according to probability. Simple, easy. Then this is what I get if I just literally roll the virtual dice for each day. Yeah, we've got the proportions roughly right, and that's fine, but we've lost something. And that's the kid's tendency to be faddy. Their tendency to say, this is our favorite cereal and eat it all week. That's gone. These virtual children appear to just arbitrarily change their mind day by day by day. We've, we've lost some of the structure that underpins the, uh, the data. So there are better ways of doing these things. So imagine that each choice of cereal is a state as it were. These rather poorly done drawings are, represent each of the, each of the cereals, uh, Cocoa Pops, Cheerios, or, or Weetabix. And then, instead of modeling what's the chances it's any of these, instead, what you should do is imagine the state transitions. There are, there are many possible state transitions in this system. We could, have, given Cocoa Pops, we could have Cocoa Pops again or we could switch from Cocoa Pops to Cheerios, or uh, Cocoa Pops to, to Weetabix. Same with Weetabix, you could have it again, or you could change to one of the other two options, and then finally again for, uh, for Cheerios. There are in fact nine state transitions. And if we model it based on, uh, if, we, if we take our data here for the state transitions, we see a slightly different story. Given Weetabix, six times, they chose to have Weetabix again. Once, they shifted to Cocoa Pops, twice to Cheerios. When um, having Cocoa Pops, nine times, they had it again. Twice, they shifted to Weetabix, they never changed to Cheerios. Is that significant? Could be, could well be, could not be, I don't know. But the point is, it is a behavior that exists in the data. And the pure random choice loses that. And similarly, uh, Cheerios, by the way, was Cheerios nine times they stuck with them. They never switched to Weetabix, and once they switched to Cocoa Pops. Now, that might be a whole different story if I were to model like a whole year, but I'm not doing it. Uh, that would be silly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and there's it in percentages. So, uh, there we go. And it's gone again. Give it a minute. Give it a minute. There we go. Thank you. Um, and that's what it would look like. 
Thank you. Um, that's what it would look like if we modelled based on the idea of state transitions. This is making a choice based on, given it's this, what are the probabilities, the, the three state transitions that could happen, and then make a probabilistic choice of which transition to enact, either the same again or one of the two switches. And this is what we get. This actually now looks rather like the original data. It's not the same, but we have captured the faddy nature of the kids' choices. Once we go to Cheerios, we stick with it for ages. Once we, uh, there's a little bit of weirdness at the beginning, and I'll return to that. But um, by and large, that's, that's not a bad replica of some virtual children having their faddy favourite of the week. So the technique was invented by this gentleman. His name is Andrei Markov. He was a Russian mathematician, and I've not read any of his papers because I am not a mathematician. Um, but the structure he, he invented was called Markov chains. So that is modelling based on state transition. So there are a couple of rules. They are discrete, meaning it's one or the other. There are three options. You can't be halfway in between. The kids in this virtual world are not allowed to like, have half a thing of Cheerios and half a thing of Weetabix. That's, that, that, that sounds like insanity. But um, that, that is not allowed. So it's one or the other. If there is like a halfway house, you'll have to make that a different state. Ah, it has no memory. <laughs> um, that's Doctor Who, by the way. Doctor Who's cool. Um, and it has no memory at all. So it is a state transition, and that is all that it is. So once it has made its choice and moved on, it's already forgotten everything that happened before. And then it'll make a new choice entirely based on what the current state is. That's all it's ever aware of, the current state and where I'm going. Um, it is only the transitions between places. That's all that we are modelling. And oh, there. It should also represent all states in the system. If there were a magical fourth serial that the kids simply never chose, it wouldn't appear in the model, and it, nor would any other serial. So for the purposes of my, my example, all states are represented, and they have to be, otherwise you will not get a proper set of data at the end. So, uh, whoop, get a, there we go, right. Um, a bit of maths so that you can actually generate a bit of... Um, a bit of data as well. So it's not just the, the states that you can, the modeling aspect, you can also get some statistical data out of these systems. Now this is a, a matrix which is absolutely nothing like the 1999 action film, which I don't even know why they called it the matrix. I think they just thought it sounded cool. Uh, because a matrix, I'm probably telling people already know this is, it's just a table of data. Um, it's, it's a bit like the film, has anyone seen the film Source Code? Why on earth is that called source code? I don't know. It's a good film, but I think they just thought it sounded cool. Anyway, this grid here actually represents um, a row for from and a row for to. So uh, there we go. So the columns are where I'm going to. So there we go. We've got, um, that's the Weetabix column, the Coca Pops column, and the Cheerios column. And then going across, that's where we're from. So. Uh, so this A, for example, is the uh, given Weetabix, Weetabix again. This one here is uh, given Cocoa Pops, therefore Cheerios now. And then we can stuff there. We also need an initial distribution. That is, what is the starting state of the system? This is the transitions, but I can't really get anything out of this unless we also know where we started. Now, in my case, it's anyone's guess, so I just arbitrarily decided it's like 30%, uh, was it 30, 30, third, third, third. So it, it'll do. And to be honest, to a degree, as you'll find out, it doesn't really matter. So an example of how you do a calculation using this system, the probability of there being Weetabix on day two is AX, which is the probability of going from Weetabix to Weetabix again, meaning we were already Weetabix and we stay there, Add that to the probability of dy, which is d, there we go, d. Oh, uh, yeah, that's y. So it's the probability of Coca Pops at all multiplied by the probability that we switch from um, uh, Coca Pops into uh, Weetabix. And then finally, we've got gz, which is based on we have Cheerios on day one, and we multiply that by the probability of given Cheerios we switch to Weetabix. Whew. 
that's a lot. But there we go. And you can do that for all of them. And what you now have is the probability on day two that you have um, any given serial. That's fine. And that's the start. But it is a lot more you can do because... <coughs> There you go. Those are the answers, by the way, in case you're interested. There's a 28% probability on day two that they will have Weetabix. <coughs> Woo. There. But then what you can do is continue applying that process again and again and again. Start with your initial distribution, which is over there. There's basically everything's on a third. Then uh, calculate the day two. Then use the day two as an input and then transform that to get the day three and so on and so forth. I did this uh, 42 times. And what you see is there's an initial bit of weirdness while it sort of sets itself up. But then after about this point, the probabilities do not change again. And in fact, it doesn't matter which initial distribution you choose. I, I chose here where they were like 0% for two of them and 100% for another, and the same exact thing happens. There's some initial weirdness, and then after a bit, it all settles out. So what that means is, if you do this process, given that you've got your set of Markov chains and all the distributions and the, uh, um, the um, state transitions, you can run this a whole load of times and you can actually get out a rough probability on any given arbitrary day of what are the chances of this state, that state, or the other state, uh, which you could use for any number of reasons. It might be sales, for example, what are the chances that on a given day anyone's going to buy this or do that. There, there's all sorts of reasons why you, why you want to have some sort of um, probability for events like that. So then returning to the subject of Jane Austen, so this is the only picture of Jane Austen that was ever drawn from life uh, by her sister. And she, uh, possibly it might well be that her sister was only an amateur artist and not the best at drawing. Poor old Jane looks a little bit grumpy here. Uh, but that could also be because she only wrote six books, which is an absolute crime. Yes, I know there's only five pictures. That's because the last two were published in one volume. But um, there were the only six books for one of the greatest writers in the English language. Not enough. And that's what I did for, for the rest of this, uh, with the rest of this um, messing around with Markov chains. So what I did uh, is I treated, treated words as a state and then started building Markov chains with the words as the state. So I started with the, the very famous opening line of Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. I don't know if that's entirely still true, but fine. She was writing this 300 years ago. I will, I will forgive her. But um, so take the first word. The first word in the book is it. There you go. And it occurs 235 times in the book. And then you can go to every instance of the word it and find the word that followed it. So 82 times the word it was followed by the word was, which makes sense, and then 72 times by the word is. And that's so on and so forth. There's a whole load of stuff until we get all the way down to did and taught and a few other words where there's only one instance of this uh, following the word it, but fine. We now have a Markov chain set for the word it. And then go to the next word, was. That occurs 1,843 times in the book. It, in fact, never has a repeat. Every single one's different. So if I was making a selection there, it's just going to be a literal random choice of, uh, of all of those words. So great. Step by step, I'm not going to go through the whole book this way, but you get the idea of how I constructed my chains. It was. Come on. Ah. And that's what I got. Now, it's a little hard to read. Don't worry too much about that. But... Using that, I did generate a whole load of text. There are problems with this, though. Well, there's always going to be, but there were certainly problems. Now, again, don't worry about reading this at the moment, but there. I don't know if you can see around here. So, for example, thank you, uh, where this slang set. <laughs> really? <laughs> thank you. Um, where we might have mentioned Mr. And that's the end of the line. It's gotten confused. It sees the full stop. And it doesn't know whether that's an abbreviation of Mr. or a full stop. It has no awareness whatsoever. And uh, by the way, for the purposes of this, I treated all punctuation marks as words. 
and new lines, because otherwise it, it kind of just turns into word soup. But um, that's not great. And we've got like a comma here, which is just a sort of weird trailing end of a uh, half finished sentence. Be uh, that she could Bennett. And that's the end of the line. So that's not quite good enough. So I did do a modified version of this that was rather better. And I'll show you how I did it now. So first off, obviously, read the text, which I got from Project Gutenberg. And in fact, I chose um, Pride and Prejudice because Pride and Prejudice is the most popular book ever to be downloaded on Project Gutenberg. It's had more downloads than anything else. So great. It's also a very good book. I recommend it if you haven't read it. Um, and then split the entire um, set of data into sentences. So use full stops uh, to, well, paragraphs. Here we go. Break that all down. That's first step. Replace all of the um, punctuation marks with the same, but with a space either side. That makes it easier for me to pick them out, because otherwise Bennett exclamation mark is considered a different word to simply Bennett. So that will make life easier. I also put a tag in to, uh, to represent chapter breaks and, and, line, and uh, line breaks and stuff like that. There we go. Then split it based on new line so that we've got all the paragraphs. Split it again. I oh, say select again, but this time I'm putting a BR tag at the end because in a bit I'm going to start munching this up into bits and it will become quite hard to see what was where originally because the line ending has also got to be considered a part of the book because otherwise you don't have paragraphs. There we go. And split again on word with, uh, with spaces. So a space is a split. So what I've got now is a gigantic array of every single word separately in the entire book and punctuation mark. It is a truth and so on like that. It's, it's colossal. But uh, modern computing being what it is, it does all of this in seconds. Um, then I created, now I'm not going to describe the whole of this, but what I did was I grouped everything into two word chains and then put the whole thing into a dictionary because I love dictionaries. And it was a dictionary with a count attached. So um, it is would be a, uh, a word pair. And then is a and so on through the first line. It is, is a, a truth and so on. Pairs of words. And then given those pairs of words, a quick scan to find how many words followed it and how many times it happened. So it is occurred all of these times and 13 times it was followed by the word a. So chances are if I had it is and was generating a follow up, I'd probably say a next. And so way. Then I don't know a better way of doing it, to be honest. I converted my, um, my list of probabilities into literally just a repeated list of the word that number of times. If anyone knows a better way, tell me. But I wanted to make a choice, and it's really simple to make a random choice if you simply repeat the word and then just choose a random element from the array. But it, it works. It works. It might not be the best, but it works. And I put in a while loop, which had a BR count, is what I called it. So I had to have an way of arbitrarily ending things. So I made it count how many times a BR, that being a line break, how many times did we get a line break? So I, I usually did like 500, just like give me 500 paragraphs of, of this stuff. And um, all it's doing is, is starting with a set of words. Now, in my case, I mean, what do you start with? I have no idea. So I just took the, the startings of each chapter and then told it to just pick one. Uh, it's not perfect, and it means we will get some initial uh, weirdness at the beginning of everything, but then, as you saw, eventually it balances out, and towards the bottom of the file it generates, you're getting some properly statistically random stuff. Well, not random, but... And then replace the BRs at the end back to... Stop it. Thank you. Uh, back to new line. <laughs> In fact, two new lines so that I get a nice break in the middle. And this is what I get. Now, that's probably going to be a little bit hard to read, but I have prepared a sample here. So to give you an idea of what this sounds like, <coughs> the idea of his sister overcome with confusion of what passed at Pemberley and Wickham, and there was a tall and pack a trunk afresh. The tumult of Elizabeth's mind was so far from suspecting that she could, to give a ball would be object. She is a noble one. It's, it's a load of tosh. 
<laughs> now, yes, it is indeed a load of tosh. Uh, feel free if you want to read some later. I, can, I have got a lot of this stuff. And um, I, I've, got about, I've got megabytes of this stuff. And it's interesting. So on one hand, yeah, it's a whole load of tosh. But if you were to sort of be listening with half an ear, it kind of feels about right. So long as you don't really try and um, pay attention to what's being said. Because what it says makes no sense at all. But still, it it has captured, well, if nothing else, roughly the rules of the English language. We've got punctuation in the right place, mostly. Speech marks in the right place-ish. Uh, you know, it, it's not too bad. And it has captured a little flavour of what Jane Austen's writing style sounded like, even if there's no plot. Because, of course, this is a stateless system. Um, well, it is rather, it doesn't have any long-term state. It's forgetting what it does every time it takes a step. So. Inside Jane Austen, you have a larger amount of structure, and that is the plot, and it can't capture that. All it's capturing is what sort of words did you tend to say given this word. But it's still fairly powerful, and I've even, uh, I, I mean, probably it's a great uh, dinner party game to, to try doing readings of this and see how long it takes before you break down. But um, I'm still mildly impressed by it. <laughs> so I sort of had a look to see what else I could do. So I have to give a trigger warning at this point because I did something a little bit naughty. Um, I, I, decided, I thought, who is, is the most evil man in the entire world? There he is. <laughs> He's a good candidate, a man whose evil is only surpassed by his bone-shattering stupidity. So I thought, he's not on Twitter anymore. I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> So I found a database somewhere of every single tweet he's ever made. And I put end tweet as a state as well as all the words. So I thought, what, what, what new words of wisdom does Mr. Trump have for us? Great news and failing at NY Times writes total fiction. That actually does sound like the sort of thing he'd say, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I can't do the accent. If anyone can, feel free, but I, I can't. But uh, yeah, that's not bad. The new Congress, but we are in total command and control of a massive amount of snow. <laughs> I would put money that he's probably said stupider things than that today. <laughs> but fine. And a third one. Now, this one's interesting. Stock market hit another record high. Don't forget Wisconsin. No action or results. We are already very angry. Time to get rich, rich, rich. Now, <laughs> not only is that quite funny, because it is, but also notice that I think that's well over the number of characters that you're allowed on Twitter. Because once again, this doesn't understand the, the overarching rules of whatever it's looking at. So I, there is a probability in there for any given word, probably, that it will end and be the end of the tweet. But once in a while, it'll just go well over it. I found some tweets that were like paragraphs long because it's got no awareness that there's a deeper rule. So what the heck can any of this do? What's the, what's the point of, of, of any of this? Are we doing for time? Okay. I'm going to massively under, underrun, I think. Well, good for you guys. Well, this is the, um, uh, this is a, mo uh, a demo, uh, excuse me. This is a diagram of Google's algorithm for page weighting. That uses Markov chains. Only a page is considered a state, a link is a state, something like that. Now, I don't entirely understand this, um, uh, how the detail of that works, but the point is it is used in the real world for all sorts of stuff. And that's one example. Predictive text messaging is probably a variation on, um, on the use of, of Markov chains. Uh, come on. Because all it's really doing is saying, given that you've entered these words, statistically, what did you tend to say next? Which is why, you know, sometimes it gets pretty good at guessing what you're likely to say next. And sometimes it freaks me out slightly because, yeah, I really would say something that silly. It's true. You know, or, or whatever. You can use it for things like the stock market or, or whatever, financial um, decisions. You can, you can use it to, um, to model the behavior of, um, of how purchasing works or how the stock market goes up and down. There's, there's all sorts, probably. I mean, I've, I, I haven't done any of that, but I know it can be done, and I know people do this. You could use it to predict the future, which 
didn't entirely turn out the way this film suggested. I am still waiting for my hoverboard. And I think we've passed the time now, so I ought to be well overdue a hoverboard. But fine. The point is that, like with my, um, with my breakfast kids, um, you could generate something that will give you a fair chance of knowing what's likely to happen next. It's a probabilistic model, so of course it's not going to tell you, yes, this will happen, but it will give you some options and some likelihoods about what comes next. Depending on how you define state, you could use it to play games. I have seen a rather lovely article around on the internet of using Markov chains to uh, give information about how to play a game, uh, like Monopoly. Consider, um, consider each square of the board to be a state. And then uh, there's, there's a whole load of other extra states you'd have to add in. There's the jail, and you probably have to do some tinkering around to, to represent how you do or don't get out of jail. But, you know, there's, there's all sorts you can do with that. And so you can get information out, like, given a Monopoly board and play a whole load of games of it, which squares are the ones that are likely to get landed on? So you can create a heat map of the Monopoly board. Uh, incidentally, I believe it's Trafalgar Square um, is, is the most likely square one you can land on. So... That's, I mean, yes, it's monopoly, but you can still use it as part of a process of understanding a system and trying to make informed decisions about where to spend your effort. In the monopoly case, you'd probably perhaps want to make sure you collect the reds. Yeah, down there. Testing. You could use this in testing because it can generate real-time uh, sequential structured data. So if you were testing a system that um, uh, perhaps is used for monitoring, you could feed the Markov chain system all of the live data from whatever it is that it's being tested. It, it would, it would um, analyze, it would like monitor, and then generate a whole boatload of live-like data and as much of it as you want. And so there you go. You don't actually have to plug it in for real, but you can simulate the behavior of the real system. And it would statistically be the same. And also, we can um, make Jane Austen a lot happier, as she appears to be in this slightly more modern, redrawn version of her sister's diagram. Um, diagram? Uh, I spend far too much time in IT. Uh, um, drawing. Because now she can write as many books as I care to generate. And every one of them a bestseller, I guarantee it. <laughs> so, let's see how we... Oh, goodness. I think, how are we doing? Ooh, I really have oven to run. That's fine. That's, you, guys get, uh, you guys get another 10 minutes of your life back. That's all right. Unless anyone has any questions, which is now your time is now. Any questions from anybody? Going once. Oh, there we go. Can you, get, can you get more realistic text by modeling it with more words leading into the next one, like four words change? Can I get more, um, more realistic results by, by putting more words into the, uh, into the, 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 like the sets of words? Yes, but this is where we get more into the art or science because the more, the more words I put in that chain, the fewer options you're going to get because if I made three, uh, then it would be like, um, it is A would be a chain. How often did she say it is A in the book? Probably not many times. And eventually, I don't know how many, I did try three and four and I didn't get great results because what will tend to happen is it'll just literally repeat the book back at you because for a lot of those long chains of words, you'll find that there literally are no other choices except the one that Jane Austen actually made. So two is a sort of happy compromise. One is not enough, and we've still not captured enough. Two looks pretty good. It, it looks fine. Um, but th three, as I remember, because I, I, I'm being honest, I wrote this quite a long time ago now, but as I remember, three was far too similar, and it wasn't new. I mean, of course, this isn't really new. It is basically Jane Austen's words pushed through a meat grinder, but it's sort of new. So. Uh, could you avoid that by uh, sampling more books? Could I avoid that by sampling more books? Yes. She took all for six books. She you did. Avoid, uh, so you can get longer chains without just repeating. Yeah. Okay, the question was, could we get more, could we put more words in the chain by sampling more books? You absolutely could. Absolutely, and that's probably a thing that's worth having a play with. Um, the, the only thing then is that you'd be mixing books and it would probably get even more surreal because then you would have like um, the poor old characters from uh, Sense and Sensibility randomly appearing and disappearing from, 
so that's what kind of went with Pride and Prejudice, so at least it would all kind of feel of a type. Uh, and actually, technically, she didn't write six books. She was like six and a half or something like that. She, she got a little bit poorly in the middle of book seven and, and never went back to it. Uh, Sand, Sanditon, I think it was called. I have not read it. Nevertheless, they are still making a whole TV series of it. Not quite sure how. Uh, I'm guessing it's basically all just made up. But uh, yeah, but you, you are right though. You probably would get a, a more accurate simulation of kind of how she wrote, but you'd probably get some slightly surreal things going on. And you'd probably similarly get much better results if it was a really, really long book. Like, uh, I, I don't know, take, take the whole of uh, the Wheel of Time book series. Those, those are like 14 books are all a thousand. But you could probably get some pretty interesting results from that, but I thought Pride and Prejudice is pretty good. Plus, Jane Austen is unlikely to sue me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't rule anything out. I, uh, I have lived long enough not to, to, not to do that, but she, she probably won't. But, but absolutely, yes. Uh, feel free to take my uh, source code and use it any way that you want. Uh, preferably not for evil. Uh, um, oh, yes. And uh, oh, First off, does any last questions before we... Okay. Um, well, thank you. And would uh, everyone remember to pop... No, one of these in the... <laughs> Uh, in the box on the way out. I'd be awfully grateful. Thank you.